Welcome back for episode 31 of the Goliath Gamecast. I'm Charlie Rogers, and as always, I'm joined by Nick Steinberg. Yeah, I'm a permanent fixture on this show, aren't I? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, as always, right? Yeah. I don't know who else I would be talking yeah, yeah, to yeah, down yeah. here by myself. Oh I'm... man, be... <laughs> one of these days I'm just going to get an email that's like, you don't need to come today. Yeah. <laughs> just... like, oh no, I've been Me... replaced. <laughs> <laughs> by, by I don't even know who it would, I don't know you find somebody I'm sure hey, get my wife down here yeah you know my dog yeah. Rudy oh okay Rudy would be a better co-host for sure I don't know Charlie has like the coolest dog he's just so chill and gigantic yeah he'd yeah. probably fall asleep within 30 seconds of the podcast yeah it'd be great yeah <laughs> Um, lots of interesting topics uh, in the world of gaming over the past two weeks. Um, starting with, so, so last week, right before we did the podcast, I got a press release from Nintendo um, just kind of mentioning that they're going to have a big announcement at 5 p.m. Um, we shot the podcast well before that, so we didn't have a chance to talk about it previously, but yeah. uh, basically they announced the Nintendo Labo. So what were your initial thoughts about the Labo when it was announced? Well, I was just thinking um, when you kind of, told me about that first email i think we just started kind of speculating right because yeah. like, the wording was really weird it's like oh gonna oh, something like change how interact with games it's like oh what are they gonna do it <laughs> were you mentioned... saying it's like oh maybe it's gonna be like a redesign of like the switch oh, yeah, or yeah. just something like crazy well, yeah. the one thing that threw a lot of people <laughs> off uh, with the speculation was they mentioned that it was for the kids or or like the kid in you or whatever. or whatever yeah child at heart but it's like that that could be like a description for any Nintendo product, really. Uh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, at this point. So we had like almost two weeks, well, pretty much right on two weeks now yeah. to digest this. So what are your thoughts on the Labo? Um, I think it's neat. Uh, Me too. I it's one of those things that I I'd like to get my hands on. It would be um a lot more justified if I did have children, but um yeah, I'd I'd like to I'd like to try it out because the thing is like, and I think this is the big question that keeps keeps coming up is how durable is it going to be yeah because these are like you know cardboard you know cutouts and you make these little man i don't even know how to describe this thing it's so weird yeah yeah you're essentially i don't know yeah it is tough to describe <laughs> yeah right like it's, you're trying to think it's yeah. toys that incorporate the switch screen and joy con right. that are made out of cardboard so it, um cost is extremely cheap if these parts were produced in um you know plastic uh, oh sure like if it was like a by, lego thing or you something. you know this yeah. might be something that we wouldn't even probably see released so the right. idea that they can make it cheap out of cardboard i guess we should quickly touch on the price here um for the okay so the robot kit is going to be priced at 79.99 us yeah that's um, kind of the expensive one yeah right? and they kind yeah. of showed off the robo kit robo what is it the, the yeah the robo kit with like really interesting i almost want to say circuitry but mechanical like they showed the inside yeah. it's like a whole series that's of one thing that really and... excites me is like even for myself like i feel like these would be really fun to build yes you know there's just the whole, because there's like a lot to it yeah and, it's like um, the whole build you get the building aspect yeah. and then you also get to play with it so i mean if you're doing it for kids or if you don't have kids it can still be fun i mean sure. there's no reason why we can't hopefully maybe do a video on goliath about I, yeah i'd love to us, yeah about the process of assembling it and and trying it all out well i think that'll be the question too is um yeah, how compelling the software is, right? Because we kind of saw in that demo reel of, um, you know, doing the little, it's like almost like mini game type things. It's yeah. like, you know, how, uh, yeah, how compelling like game experiences are those going to be? Like, are they going to be kind of like a like full game thing or is it just going to be like another like, um, you know, like we've seen on countless, or like, well, it was on the Wii mostly. It was like um, the, the Wii Party and those kind of releases, Wii right? Wii Music, which Wii wasn't music. really... Yeah, a... where it just kind of became this collection of sort of mini-games. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel this is going. Well, you're but... right. It's going to come down to how well the software is implemented into the system, right? If right. It, if it's not good software, then, you know, Labo's not going to succeed if it's not fun yeah. to play. The piano looks really cool. Yeah, I so yeah. the Variety Kit is going to sell for $69.99. Um, and you get the piano, you get the little um, remote control. It's like a little, looks like a little bug. It's like RC car things or something. Yeah, uh, it's... Uh, fishing rod. Fishing rod. It, something that looks like, kind of like a steering wheel. It, it's, well, there's like that motorbike thing. Yeah. It's got the handlebars or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, interesting. That one really interests me. The handlebars, if you can do like a little racing game where you can control the momentum by, you know, revving the handlebars. Yeah. So, yeah. the more I think about this, initially I was like, this is not for me. And I have two boys. Right. Um, 
the more I think about it, the more compelling it is. I personally would probably yeah. go for the variety pack over the over the robo pack. I yeah, I think so too. Just because I like the variety out, experiences. Yeah, a bunch of things. Yeah, yeah. it seems kind of interesting. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we can discuss a little bit. Um, I, I found it really interesting that you know Nintendo has done. We're going to speak after this about the Nintendo earnings report. Right. Uh, Nintendo has just done so well in the past year. I love the fact that they can now feel comfortable to do something crazy. Oh, yeah, take take a chance on yeah. something, right? Yeah, because, yeah, they already know there's a lot of, you know, switches in the wild now. They're going to continue selling more, and, uh, yeah, they can come out with something kind of kooky like this, you know? It is it is very much a classic Nintendo move. It's like, oh, yeah, of course they would do something like that. They're going this. back and, to their roots of yeah. being a toy company, and Nintendo yeah. has always released, you know, even you, you see it in their consoles. Yeah. They, they, they really are a toy company and, at heart. And if Sony or Microsoft were releasing something this like this, we'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> Like this cardboard crap? What do you? It and it's seem, like Nintendo does it. It's like, ooh, that's it would seem neat. desperate. Like they were yeah. grasping at, yeah. you know, trying to find the next new thing. But for this Nintendo, doesn't. it's just like them. Like they're like having fun. Right? I, every, I just love like when I initially saw this. I'm just like, okay, yeah. but, like in the best way. I'm like, good for you, Nintendo. Like, yeah. I, I love that Nintendo is willing to take these chances. And <laughs> the more I think about Labo, the the more interesting it is to me. I mean. People are going to be able to produce um, 3D printed parts. Um, you're going to see a lot of like third party productions of uh, both the cardboard. Yeah. And per uh, actually, like I've heard print out like the stencil to to make the pieces. So if you do break a piece, there's no reason why you couldn't take a piece of cardboard, trace around it, and and essentially reproduce that piece right. of cardboard. I, I would assume that that would be pretty easy. Yeah. Um, duct tape. You can just duct tape the whole of course, thing. Yeah, it solves everything. That right? would make it super durable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you'll see companies probably reproducing a lot of this in in like the uh, 3D printed form. So it's not cardboard. Yeah. It's actually like a, a lightweight uh, more... 3D printed plastic. Yeah. Or, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, kind of staying with Nintendo here. Uh, we just today got the uh, Nintendo earnings report for, um, I guess, the last quarter of 2017, yeah, yeah, three, uh, for the three months ending uh, in December 2017. Yeah. Now, we had heard before Christmas that Nintendo had hit that tw that 10 million mark, or were approaching that 10 million mark. Yeah, right? and they were, um, they increased, I think, their uh, forecast for um for the one year mark that they would sell 14 million switches yeah and now it's up to is it 15 million? they've increased their yeah. yeah projections to 15 million um as of right now i think the number is 12.13 million units sold so wow. that I, i'm pretty sure incorporates the sales over the christmas period so basically um two months okay so it, yeah so it ended on december 31st it looks like okay and so and so i was seeing um kind of a different version of this story that was i think incorporating you know sales up until like today so it'd be the end of january and it was saying that the switch has now outsold the wii u's lifetime sales which i think were 13 and a half million now it seems like that isn't quite confirmed but that wouldn't surprise me if they were up to that number if it was 12.13 million units at the end of, end of December. December. So yeah, they Sold could have done another million possible. Yeah. It, it's possible. Yeah. yeah. I, I haven't seen that, but yeah, that, I mean, that doesn't sound out of the norm. Right. 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 Um, we also got some sales numbers on some of the recent releases of the uh, first party Nintendo games. Super Mario Odyssey, uh, hit, hit 9.07 million units. Yeah. Sold. It's the, console's best-selling game so far yeah pretty impressive that's, attachment right that's there amazing, actually yeah that's, that's like almost you know one copy for every switch sold yeah like it's getting close like three yeah like 75 percent of the total hardware sold. yeah like that's basically crazy. seven to eight people who own the switch also own yeah um mario so that's broad appeal and then mario kart 8 deluxe is the the next runner up with 7.33 million. Really did really well. Splatoon yeah. 2. Splatoon 2 is doing well, yeah. Almost 5 million yeah. units. So I think um, Breath of the Wild is, uh, where is it? I don't see it in here, but I think it was 6, 6 6.7 million around there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, safe to say that <laughs> the Switch is doing pretty well for itself. Now there was a number here for total. Yeah, okay. So total software units sold mm. 47 million so that's an attachment rate of almost four games per switch wow 
which is really good because I remember attachment rates on the Wii U and, and Wii not being kind of like dismal. Yeah, not yeah. great. So essentially yeah. that's, you know, for the average Switch owner owns, you know, the, like around four games. Yeah. yeah. This is really interesting to me because I feel like there's still quite a few people out there that are still writing off the Switch as this, you know, fad or whatever. Or like Nintendo isn't a real game company, all this stuff. And it's, you know, like we're seeing you know, concrete data backing up that it's like, well, no, the Switch is is doing really well. It's not just some, you know, fad. I could see if we had seen the sales taper off after, like, the first three months or something, right? But And I think we're also seeing the end of um, that kind of story that Nintendo was artificially, um, yeah, you know, decreasing. Demand. Yeah, increasing demand just by, like, not having supply. It seems like they, they literally just can't make enough of these because if they've sold... Uh, be way beyond like what their expectations were in the beginning. Yeah, I yeah. think we're at the point now with Nintendo. If you want a Switch, you can get one. Like yeah, whenever it's I much go, easier. Yeah, I go to Walmart and yeah. I always every time I go to Walmart, obviously I go down the video games aisle um, to see. So I, yeah. I do see Switches. I see. I do not see the SNES Classic, which uh, sold absolutely amazing. Uh, but we did not get an actual. I wish they would give us a final number on how many yeah. SNES Classics they sold, yeah, but it doesn't look that. like it's here. But um, really strong sales for the 3DS once again, um, selling almost 6 million units. Yeah, this one kind of surprised me. Um, I guess, uh, you know, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon would play kind of a role in that, but you said that the, I think the software sales were down though. Yeah, uh, um, down 33% okay. um, overall, but yeah. if you think about the number of releases, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of... Uh, 3DS games that have come out. The Pokemon no. games uh, looks like they sold. Well. Where's the number? Seven point one seven million. Yeah, yeah, so pretty good sales for for the two Pokemon. Considering they're basically re-releases of the Pokemon game from the year previous. Ex too. Exactly. Yeah, like, so yeah. they've milked that for sure. Like, imagine when um, that the sales numbers will be even better for a Nintendo Switch release for the Pokemon game that's coming uh by the time that happens I would they would be well past that 15 probably approaching 20 million by the end of you know 20 I Yeah, would I think, think that I think that's kind of that's the a safe number now. Yeah, 20 million. By like yeah. the next holiday season, I would yeah. say. Or at least their ne end of their next fiscal year which would be like March 2019. Yeah. So, I mean, with an attachment rate at 50%, that's 10 million units right there for a Pokemon game, so I think it would do much better on if it did come to the Switch is my yeah. point. So. Yeah, I mean, we keep saying that um, like 2018 is going to be just a really interesting year for Nintendo and the Switch. So I think this is kind of a kind of interesting way to kick off the year is seeing like them on like the highest they've been in years. Yeah. And kind of seeing if they can continue that or kind of what will happen. Yeah, yeah, I'm really happy to see Nintendo having the success. And like I said, it's... It's led to them doing some quirky things, which I yeah. always love to see with those. There's so many geniuses that just work in Nintendo and come up with. I've talked about in games before and being able to keep 30 year old franchises fresh and interesting. Um, the idea that they've got teams just thinking of interesting ways to use that, the hardware, yeah, is just so encouraging to me, and I'm really looking forward to what Nintendo does. Um, you know, even with the Labo line, where they where they can go from there. Sky is kind of the limit. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on to the next story, uh, Microsoft just announced that they'll be expanding their Xbox um, subscription service, the yeah. Xbox Game Pass. This one kind of blew me away. This yeah. is a pretty big deal. Do you yeah. want to take this one? Yeah, well, so basically, I mean, Game Pass has been available since, I think, like June of last year, something like that. So it's basically their Netflix sort of model where it's a subscription service, 10 bucks a month, yep. you get access to... I think it's like 100 games or a little over 100 games. Yeah. Um, mix, Xbox One. Mi yeah, a mix of Xbox One, 360. Yeah. Quite a few 360 games on there, but that's kind of to be expected. But, um, you know, unlike something like uh, PlayStation Now, where you're streaming the games, these ones you you can download every game. Yeah, that's a big thing which for, is huge. Yeah. for, I think, everyone. I mean, yeah. This whole, the whole idea of streaming games is interesting, but it just, in practice, I feel like it's just, I, I would much rather have that game on my hard drive. Yeah, and it's one of those things where as long as you keep that subscription, you'll yeah. be able to still access that game. And even if that game disappears from the service, if, as long as you have it downloaded, you still essentially have it. Yeah. Your, um, so yeah, so Game Pass, they really seem to Microsoft really seems to be doubling down on it because they've announced that 
every new first party microsoft game is going to be available on game pass day and date with the release date so, which is crazy like so i mean all jokes aside that like haha so that means like two games because i mean microsoft they don't have a ton coming out this year unless yeah. i i still feel like they have something kind of hidden that's gonna come out later in the year there'll like be a, a big like release a big yeah during the holidays yeah that we don't know about right but now um sure. so that means uh, so sea of thieves will be kind of the first test case because that comes out in march so that game is going to be yeah it's going to be the first one where it'll be on game pass as soon as it's um out in stores yeah so i mean essentially um if you're looking at a per, per year you're looking at 120 dollars so if there are two games that yeah. you are going to plan on buying anyways you may as well get the game pass yeah and, and download them to play there yeah because you're getting a ton of other games too and i think they said that they're going to add like all the first party games yeah to it well at some point like they haven't talked about like previous games which so by this wording, then okay, that means we I should... Thought maybe, I thought they did, but... I, I, I don't know. They yeah. may have, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I haven't... I, I, I don't think they have. <laughs> um, okay. Because I want to know, like, is, are we going to get Forza 7, Forza Horizon 3? 3, right, yeah. Like, are those games, I the I newest believe, I believe, like I believe that's that's already on there, I think, Gears of War 4. Is it? I think so. I know one uh, Gears Halo, is. Halo 5 is, definitely. Yes, Halo 5 is. I have the list um, here. Yeah. Sunset Overdrive. Is. Sunset Overdrive. Yeah. Um, I think Recore. Recore, yeah. Do I see? I don't see Recore. I know um, Recore is. Yeah, I, I just went through it? the library the other day. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah Recore. I, you're right. Yeah. So there's definitely. It's a definitely. I mean, uh, State of Decay. The first. The first yeah. one is on there. So, so State, so, of, uh, State of Decay Two. Yeah. Will be on there. So here, the, the uh, three Crackdown main. Three. Yeah, the three main yeah. games we'll get in 2018 um, are sea of, starting with Sea of Thieves. Yeah. Um, Crackdown Three and State of Decay Two, um, with the latter being two games that I was definitely going to buy. Um, but Sea of Thieves is, has a beta right now or an alpha. I can't remember what exactly they're calling it, but yeah. uh, it seems to be pretty good people seem to be enjoying their i'm excited about it yeah, yeah so it's definitely something that i'm willing to check out so my point is i think um the day that it's released will be you'll, the day that, I, a, that yeah. I jump in yeah you know and i can sell off some of you know my halo games i'm sure that's worth three dollars now and yeah get yeah. rid of some of the games i have in my library and yeah. maybe you know just play them through there um the other cool thing is they've confirmed that any of these games that you can also play on pc you know through the xbox anywhere well yes. you'll also be able to do that if you have a Game Pass, so you could play Sea of Thieves on PC, you could oh play, my. you know, Crackdown 3, whatever. Yeah. That's a as huge as seller for me. Yeah. yeah. So That's you're essentially awesome. getting, you know, your PC library up too. I wonder yeah. if Crackdown will show up. I mean, um, I Cuphead. 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 I wonder I if that'll show up in there. Yeah, I don't know. That'd be interesting. Well, if they are doing their, all their first party stuff or whatever, that... Or was yeah, that, no, it's not that first, first party. Oh, that was, oh yeah. Because it's, just it's, it's, it's Microsoft Game Studios games but yeah. you would think that yeah. you know with the games that so or, the third party games in that are on the service right now there's some interesting stuff um uh, Meg, Mega Man legacy you've got uh mad max which was a great game yeah for sure i mean it does skew a little heavier to like some older titles but i mean it's a good way to like increase your hard drive like you could just have game pass and have way more than enough to play yeah it looks like every gear gears of war game is on here yeah so i mean for ten bucks a month, I think it's actually twelve here in Canada. But uh, yeah, well, still, yeah, that's a great deal. It's a, yeah, like it's, I always think for move. you know for it's not necessarily the best deal for me, but um, I always think of like my nephews. You know, twelve bucks a month here in Canada, ten yeah. bucks everywhere else. Um, that's just fantastic value. Yeah, and it's very much that Netflix thing where people will probably get this and then they'll just keep paying for it, and maybe they're not even using it. Right? It's just like. Okay, well, yeah, ten bucks a month. It's not you know a huge deal, and it's and cool to have this. You. That's how they get because you because it auto. So yeah, they're getting you know guaranteed revenue because you know questions will come out. It's like oh, how is this going to impact sales of these games? It's like, well, Microsoft's making money off them either way, right? It's yeah. like I don't know how good it is for the studios themselves, but retailers. Yeah, or yeah, retailers. Yeah, they're not going to be too happy. About no, this there's been one, a lot but... of uh, feedback in the last couple yeah. of days about retailers not being happy about no, this, but but it's a. It's a very pro-consumer move, though. I think. Absolutely. I mean, as much as it isn't, you, you won't be owning the games, right? And that's a, kind of a thing. But at this point, it's like, does it does it matter that much? The Net I don't know. Netflix model. We talked about yeah. it with Nintendo. Like you said, yeah. people will sign up, and it has the reoccurring charge, and people just it's it's easier just to let it happen if you're not using it, and they'll get all those people that yeah. they're you know people that might do this. Say they want Sea of Thieves. 
They're like, oh, I'll just get the Games Pass. And maybe they just did it for that game. But they'll most likely let it run for a year or two. And yeah. now Microsoft has gotten, you know, $240 out of a person that they may have just gotten 50 And of. it's great, too, because I find this happens, too, you know, with, with friends. Like, a new game comes out, and it's like, you all want to play it together. But it's like, what? You don't want to drop $80. Yeah, out. that's like, a great $80 point. here in Canada, right? Or 60 in the U.S. Yeah. On a new game. It's like, yeah. oh, that's expensive. You for know? multiplayer but, games, you're yeah. right. But now it's like, if you guys all have Game Pass can play any of these yeah you know? yeah that's a great point for multiplayer games yeah, yeah for sure i um, mean it'd be nice if they could somehow get PUBG into there i mean i, I doubt that'll happen and i, I don't know about i the... feel like it's just selling so well on its own that it's like what do they really need to they would yeah. have to i yeah. guess negotiate some yeah. deal with um the company that makes which i forget the korean company that makes PUBG. Uh, <laughs> blue hole blue hole yes. yeah um yeah so yeah xbox game pass uh I'm in. Not, yeah, not the kind of Xbox announcement I was really expecting at the beginning of the year. Like, anyone was really predicting that they would do this with Game Pass, you know? I feel like it's been relatively successful for them, but I could. I think the subscriptions are going to go up big time now. Well, we talked about the, the Xbox infrastructure, you know, with the backwards compatibility, um, stuff like, you know, the, the Games Pass. Yeah. Now they've got the, the most powerful console. The best place to play third-party games because they'll run the yeah. best. They've got this They're, great yeah. ecosystem. All they need is now is yeah, some the exclusive games. games. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna, actually going to do an, a Microsoft Xbox predictions video that will be up on Goliath um, in the coming weeks, uh, where we'll kind of break go into this a little bit deeper. But yeah. um, you know, I feel that Microsoft should really spend some money this year and go out and acquire some new studios. Like one big studio, yeah. Yeah, kind of leading yeah. into another story quickly. Um, it was announced, not announced, there was a, a rumor that mm -hmm. Microsoft had actually looked into purchasing um, several, I think it, actually they looked into purchasing, uh, it might have been Blue Hole outright, uh, but EA was another rumored one that, that Microsoft actually considered buying EA. That's, Could you that's imagine? crazy to me. <laughs> it's like you, you forget just how much damn money Microsoft has. Yeah. That they could buy a company as big as EA, or yeah. at least you know, consider it. Um, I think, I think Valve was another another one. Yes, that you're came right. Up? Yep, Valve. Oh, Valve. Yeah. With Steam, could you imagine? Oh my! I, I don't even. Oh. Maybe would finally get that new Half Life. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> they put that, them to work right away. Wouldn't that be massive? <laughs> A new Portal. Yeah. Oh man, Valve. No, you guys are making games again. All right. <laughs> um, were there any other ones? I did. I didn't read over this story, so... No, I think yeah. EA was the... I just saw so EA and was like, You were just Whoa. like, what? Yeah. Like, man, that would be... Did, did they say insane. why, like, they kind of... I think it was... It, I think or? it just came out that they were, you know, oh, considering the, it. I okay. think it was, you know... Yeah. I don't that, think they were in That kind talks. of stuff happens all the time, though. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's encouraging because it sounds like Microsoft is out there you know, looking at these possibilities of buying right. companies so we can get some exclusive games and, you know, dedicating funds to certain areas where, you know, it bring back certain games that we haven't seen in a while. Maybe uh, we'll finally get a Crimson Sky, you know, remake that I've been asking for for like eight years. So. Or, tying into another rumor, that new Fable game looks to be on the way. Yeah, um, so, uh, done by the studio um, that makes... Um, the Forza Horizon games, yeah. Yes. Uh, is it Playground Games? Yes, Playground yeah. Games. Um, so, in 2017, Playground, Playground Games opened up a big new studio, um, and they hired a bunch of project leads from who had worked on previous games, like uh, Metal Gear Solid, GTA... Uh, Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. Yeah. So I think Horizon some... Zero Dawn was the other one. Or I don't know if they got anybody from Horizon, but they, I've heard that they said like Horizon was the big uh, game that made them think like, oh, gave them idea for like a new fable. So that, that excites me. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I absolutely loved the first and second fable. Never played the first. Love the second one. The third one, I think I got about halfway through. I, I never made it to the part where you become the king. You know, yeah, and start I don't even remember the... if I played the third one, no. but I remember the second one I was like... back to it, actually. No. I, yeah. I'm, I'm working on my top five games of all time, and I'm actually going to have to go back and look at Fable 2, because I remember really? absolutely loving that game. Wow, I mean, five. I don't I don't know if it would okay. make Okay, oh five. yeah, you just want to get But I just idea. remember yeah. really loving that game, so... Yeah, um, me too. I, yeah, I played that obsessively. I would love yeah. to see a Fable game redone. I mentioned earlier, before we started the podcast, that, you know, if they were to do this, it would have to be... I just... Put as much time into this as you need. Yeah. Don't rush this out. 
and give us a proper yeah. Fable game. It's tough because Microsoft needs games now. Yeah, absolutely. But it's like, how how long ago did they start? You know, it not, sounds... not, not even just this one, but just in general. Like, how close are their, you know, internal teams or whoever they've hired, like, to getting some of these games out, right? Like, I don't know how far along the next Halo is and all that, but, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, because Fable has kind of come on hard times you know, recent years, like, they had that, uh, what was it, Fable Legends, I think, was the one that was cancelled, and it was, like, some weird, like, co-op kind of free-to-play thing. Yeah. I actually was kind of looking forward to it, then it was, you know, I canned. just want, it was like, oh. I mean, even with, yeah, I just want, like, a return to, even with part three, it was just like, oh, man, yeah. this is, and I think it would be good, too, because now, you know, Peter Molyneux, who, from Lionhead, who was, you know, the director behind all the, the first three games, you know, he won't be involved anymore, so they can kind of get out of the way of that, like, you know, promising the yeah. world kind of thing. They'll just, <laughs> oh yeah, you'll be able to, the the, the game will uh, raise your children, and <laughs> I, don't know, I, like, I just, almost wish they would yeah. bring him in in some role, just because, yeah, yeah. you know, I think he I has really good ideas yeah, for it. Yeah, I associate that yeah. game. Bring him on as a consultant. And I really hope it doesn't lose that British charm. Yes. I love that. Me too. About it, yeah. So yeah, hopefully uh, we see a Fable game. I doubt we see this in 2018. No, or even, I don't even know if we'll see an <laughs> announcement, but I mean, yeah, if they are working on one, I think that's great news. Um, kind of shifting to some news about EA it recently, um, I think actually just in the last couple of days, mm -hmm. um, they re announced that Star Wars Battlefront 2 sales missed their targets, although not by a whole lot. Not by a lot, no. Uh, so the Wall Street Journal is reporting that you know, EA still expects to sell anywhere from one to three million copies uh, before the end of the fiscal year, which would be, you know, the end of March. Mm -hmm. uh, but this would still fall short of uh, the original Battlefront's 14 million sales mark. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the loot boxes and the controversy around that is really seems to be what's to blame here. And I think the company is actually actively, you know, pointing to that as the reason. Which isn't really a surprise. Yeah. Now, um, are you surprised that they still managed to sell nine million? Yeah, I am, I am actually. Bit. Well, it's hard to say because I feel like, yeah, that that one million um, kind of decrease, you can directly relate, I oh, think, yeah. to people avoiding that. But uh, Star Wars is such a big brand, and this was always going to be a big like commercial game that I'm sure like most of those sales are probably from people that like didn't care about any of that they're just like "Ooh, star wars game yeah i mean it doesn't seem like a complete disaster that it could have been you know like this game with all this controversy you know i was thinking okay if they're if i had to guess if their projection was 10 million i would have guessed maybe five because right. of all the issues that still happen so it sounds like they've at least avoided a complete disaster now i guess like you said they had relied on some a major revenue stream coming from those microtransactions. Right. So, you know, the initial look at, you know, well, they sold, they wanted to sell 10, they only sold nine, is magnified by the fact that they have zero microtransactions and we're probably expecting sure. millions and millions of dollars from that. Yeah. Um, so another kind of interesting, I guess, update to this story is that um, EA CEO Andrew Wilson has kind of denied reports that uh, Disney was basically pissed off at EA for the way that they handled microtransactions and you know he reports that like kind of everything is good between them and he doesn't expect any kind of like pushback from Disney once they you know implement microtransactions again I guess because they're confident that the way they have it set up will be kind of a, a much better system than before i hope so yeah um, i mean well, is anyone going to care about the game by the time they put microtransactions they'll be in? that core oh, group yeah. that they'll still be able to milk yeah. some like microtransaction money sure in. but the way it was reported when this all went down was that disney basically called up andrew wilson and was like hey, listen get yeah. this out and, yeah and you know i doubt that's how it went down i would actually lean more towards andrew wilson telling the truth here like i'm i'm sure that the relationship is probably fine yeah um just going forward you know let's just hope that there's a dialogue between ea and disney and ea needs to avoid the situation in the future and i i think that they will i hope you never maybe, know maybe get the message yeah i guess we'll see once what what their microtransaction system is that they're gonna put in i mean it and sounds like different. it sounds like enough people kind of spoke with their wallet to yeah. to the point where it, it made a dent in ea's profits 
and yeah. uh, it should be something that they consider going forward yeah. to, you know, not piss I off think, their fan base. I think it's good to see. Like, I think this is a like actually like you know a positive story for everyone, but EA because usually when you see a story about you know a game not meeting sales expectations, it's it kind of sucks. But in this case, it's well because it kind of deserved to sell less, right? Yeah. yeah. I you know, I still really enjoyed the game. I think you came around a little bit on okay, the game. Okay, yeah, I started to like it a little more after I played it. I haven't touched it. Like, since before Christmas, I think, yeah. now. But, uh, you know, I, I drop back in for some matches. Yeah. Yeah. I just keep going back to, like, I, I just feel so sorry for, you know, developers yeah, and producers the people who worked that, on that it. put a yeah, lot of work and love into this game. For sure. And to have it ruined by, you know, decisions that are made by higher ups yeah. is, is, is frustrating, I yes. can imagine. Working. Yeah, because those are the people that are, you know, receiving the brunt of the, the hate online. Jim Sterling just re recently did... A video kind of addressing that i don't know if you saw oh it was, no i haven't seen that one it was no. really interesting but he touched on that like you know uh these lower you know developers that have had to deal with like stuff like in community manager specifically oh yeah having to deal with death threats because of you know decisions that were made by the higher ups exactly. and, and they're the ones that are accessible because they're that like the can, face of the company yeah kind of thing, direct yeah. their hate towards For sure. it's like yep. you know the the frustration is just not directed at the right people and yeah, so it's it's unfortunate what happened, but let's just all hope that everyone has learned a lesson. Even other gaming companies who yeah. employ these models can kind of learn from this. So, um, kind of sticking with EA here, um, just recently announced that Anthem will be pushed to twenty nineteen. Yeah, I don't think this is really a surprise. No, I don't think anybody expected that to make actually come out this year. Yeah, uh, let's hope it makes twenty nineteen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Um, well, because the. The E3 reveal trailer came with the, you know, coming in 2018 yeah. thing at the end. And I guess even the people at Bioware were like, no, it definitely is not. Like, <laughs> I don't know why that's on there. Like, we're de that's going to be tough to make. Yeah, so. But I guess Bioware is really doubling down on Anthem now. Like, it's kind of the studio's new hope now after uh, you know, Mass Effect and Andromeda disappointed so much. But also tied with this announcement mm -hmm. that Anthem had been pushed... Um, apparently we're going to get a new Battlefront, Battlefield game in 2018. Yeah, uh, this is cool. So two years after Battlefield 1, and I think you were saying that the rumor is it'll be a new Bad Company game, possibly? I, I, there's I been mean, rumors floated around. Yeah. Like, I don't know how substantiated there, but if you, yeah. if you think about it, like... Kind of makes sense. Yeah, because like yeah. A, a new Battlefield game, they're still releasing content for the for Battlefield 1. I think it's getting, or just I got... I think it just got a new update or yeah, something like and, that. You yeah. know, that, scene, yeah. that game seems to be going strong. Mm -hmm. um, so I find it hard to believe that they would... Well, I guess they could go to a tr traditional modern setting sure. of uh, a Battlefield, but yeah. man, Bad Company... I love the Bad Company games. <laughs> Everybody I mean, I loves obsessed like, with the, the dialogue, yeah. the story, the characters. Just a, a, a little bit different from the traditional Battlefield game. Yeah, but then you also get the you know awesome multiplayer too. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, it, I'd like to see them revisit this. Was it Bad Company too that kind of really introduced the um, uh, the building destruction and stuff yes. like that? Yeah, yeah. that was. Well, I big, think it was the, it was the first the first um, one. Yeah, because that was when there was the big showcase for the Frostbite engine. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I remember just being blown, blown away by that. Legs. I was like, what? And blown away, huh? <laughs> so, yeah, not all that surprising that EA plans to release a new Battlefield game this year, but I think we're both hoping it will be a bad company game. Yeah, I'm just super Not excited. something else. Uh, so kind of, you know, moving on, switching gears here, and uh, getting out of the news bit, uh, I'd like to talk about kind of what we've been playing lately. Okay, well, uh, I haven't been playing a whole lot. Oh, Charlie, killing me here. <laughs> I've been playing. I've been playing mostly retro stuff. So, oh, okay. I'm actually working on um, updating our uh, or creating our top 25 Dreamcast games of all time. I think we yeah. have a, a, a top 10 list up right now on Goliath.com. Need some updating. Yeah. But as yeah. we've mentioned before, I have a complete Dreamcast collection, so I've been working on uh, pushing that out to a top 25 uh, Dreamcast games of all time. So I've been. Kind of doing a bunch of research, playing a few games there to, to develop that list. Um, that and just some kind of retro Game Boy games. I've been playing some Kirby Star Stacker on my original Game Boy. Oh, nice. Which okay, is yeah. a you game I always one. go yeah. back to. Yeah, I've heard you bring that one up before. Puzzle yeah. games yeah. on the Game Boy. If I'm just sitting on the couch watching the game, I love pulling sure. out my old Game Boy and playing yeah. through some of those I think I saw you playing Picross on the Switch Picross on the Switch. You're right. I you know what? That, that's my unwind 
like before I go to bed game. Yeah, that's because a great one. it like you know it kind of like taxes me right like like mentally and then yeah. I just kind of fall asleep. But from not, it. not so super just, stimulating. No, yeah. it's just kind of like all right, it's a puzzle game. I gotta figure this out. Yeah, that was yeah. my that was my wake Love up that one. Saturday morning with my coffee, play a couple yeah, puzzles. Sure. Yeah, pick cross S on the Nintendo Switch. So um, there's been some interesting releases uh, in the, in the past two weeks. The yeah. biggest one being one that you're playing. Yeah, um, just started playing. Uh, so preliminary thoughts here, but uh, Monster Monster Hunter World. Uh, do you have much experience with the Monster Hunter games? Not really. I, no. I jumped in on the 3DS, one of the 3DS releases, and put a couple hours in, too, okay. but uh, not, not not really. Yeah, it's it's been one of those series I've always just kind of looked at as like, oh, that looks cool, yeah. but <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's like the super involved RPG. Yeah, a little intimidating it's, to me. Yeah, yeah. pretty intimidating. Uh, and I think also the platforms that it's been on, too. I've yep. been like, I don't really want to play a game like that on my 3DS. Yeah, like, for that's sure. That's kind of weird. I know there's been some console versions, but, uh, so this is, you know, the first, like, really big budget Monster Hunter, uh, game. You know, so it's on, uh, Xbox One and PS4. I'm playing it on Xbox One. Um, just started up last night. Uh, mostly played the create a character mode because it, it, it's pretty in-depth. Pretty exciting. Uh, so I made my character, he looks like, just like um Geralt from Witcher 3 okay, cool. I went out because there was like a, a preset that kind of looked like him I'm like well that's what I'm going with yeah yeah my monster <laughs> hunter is gonna be it makes sense right yeah, I think you sure. know he's a monster hunter Absolutely. in the series and yeah he looks a lot like him it's pretty cool um and then you also you also get a cat companion which is like the cutest coolest <laughs> thing ever it's like this little like cat that'll walk around and he kind of helps you I don't really know how he plays into like what his function is in the game yet but um, you get to design your cat too. Oh, cool! Which can you, know, you pick a dog instead of a cat? No, no. just cats. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if, if, if you had to describe a Monster Hunter game, like what uh, would you say it's like a cross between? It feels like a cross between a lot of things, and you know, granted that like I have, I haven't even fought a monster yet. Like yeah. I've just started kind of tooling around. Like I'm, I'm trying to pick my, uh, kind of my weapon, my starting weapon right now, which it's actually more of an. <laughs> in-depth task than I oh, thought it no, would be. Oh, no, yeah. That's one thing I yeah. remember. And so it's cool because... A lot I of, mean, like, Dark Souls a little bit when it comes to Scott, that. Yeah, and, well, depending on which class you kind of pick because um, I wasn't expecting this. Like, I thought it was kind of just a, you know, hack the same button if you're doing melee to chop at guys or, um, you know, I know there's ranged weapons too, but yeah. um, now each like weapon is way different from the other one. It feels yes. like you're playing a different game. And certain bosses require, you know, you need to use this weapon on this sure. boss for yeah. the situation. Yeah, that's yeah. what I remember about the gaming. Really yeah, so I was really just going in and being like, okay, like what weapon do I want? Oh, this one's cool. I don't know about this one. Like it's like some really slow ones. Like yep. there's like those huge swords, like yep. the buster swords. So you're really slowly moving around. And um, I think the one that I'm going with is, and it reminded me exactly of... Um, the switch weapons in Bloodborne. Um, okay. So it kind of is this like sort of sword and shield at first and then you put them together and it turns oh, into okay. a big thing. I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think that's the one I'm going to go with. Um, but it's, you know, it looks like a, like a beautiful game, like really in depth. Um, very much, very, very JRPG, which isn't usually a genre I tend to be drawn to. Yeah. But um, just the kind of the co-op factor really, you know, makes me want it. I think this will be the one that I really kind of sink into. Yeah, you're playing it with someone else? Or? Yeah, yeah. So um, my roommate, actually, he, he's, he, he bought it and we have, um, you know, kind of shared Xboxes or whatever. Yeah, we, like we both that. have, Yeah, we have cool. them actually set up right now where both TVs are beside each other. Both <laughs> It's like ridiculous. Awesome. Yeah, I'm like, let's just leave it like this. This is the greatest. <laughs> like, I don't even have Is my Xbox like, in my room anymore. But... Right in the living room? Yeah, like, yeah. It's just choo -choo like, there we go. Yeah. The life of <laughs> so, a bachelor. That's yeah, awesome. So, I know. It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. But um, yeah, so yeah, we're going to play through that. And then um, a couple of our other buddies are guys. So we're going to have a four-player team That's going. That's cool. Yeah, I can't wait to, you know, jump into that. So yeah, I'm going to play more you know, over the next week, week or whatever. And yeah, next episode, I should have a lot more thoughts on this game. But right now I'm, you know, I'm excited to try it out. Yeah. yeah. Some other interesting releases that came out this week that we haven't had a chance to play yet, but we saw yeah. um, Dragon Ball Fighter Z. Fighters, or Fighter apparently. Z. Apparently that's the official <laughs> pronunciation, which I don't know. It's a capital Z and it ends in, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. It looks really sure. good. I saw it briefly at the uh, Namco... Uh, Bam Namco Bandai, uh, yeah, yeah. Namco Bandai booth at, at E3, yeah. Um, uh, made by Arc System Works, the 
worked on the game, so really renowned fighting game. Yeah, what else creators. have they done? Why can't I, I can't um, think of anything? Arc System right Works. Now. They did the, I believe the Blaze. Remember Blaze Blue or Blaze yeah, okay. Blue? I'm yep. pretty sure that's Arc System Works. Yeah. Uh, really gorgeous art style. You were saying kind of a lot like kind of the Marvel versus Capcom craziness. Which... Well, it's a three on three fighter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This one surprises me. Um, I want I want to play it now. Actually, usually I'm like. Well, I was a fan of Dragon Ball, okay, like, growing up, Dragon Ball Z and everything like that. I used to watch it. Um, you know, kind of casually played some of the fighting games, but there's been so many of them yeah. that it's like, you know, there's an announcement of a new Dragon Ball Z game. It's like, I don't care. Yeah, and you're just like, yeah, oh, another, cool. you know, another, the, here's the yeah. quarterly Dragon Ball game. But I've heard this one is, is the best one, could be the best one ever. Yeah. And, you I've know, that, that gets me excited. Like, it's like a legitimately good fighting game. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a Dragon Ball Z person. I know sure. nothing about it. Um, I but feel I like that totally is, might not up. even be it doesn't necessary matter. No, in this one. Like, yeah. I, I see this game, it looks great, Yeah, and uh, I hear that it's a great fighter. I would definitely uh, check this one out. Yeah, so um, hopefully we'll get a you know chance of one of us at least to play it You know, at some point. I'd, I'd like to check it out. Yeah, we'll yeah. have to reach out and maybe see if we can get a yeah, copy and yeah. give our impressions. Yeah. Um, another game that really has interested me is Celeste. Um, yeah. Made by I just heard about this a one small yesterday. company yeah. called uh, Matt Makes Games. Now, they made uh the tower fall games tower right, fall right. ascension which i played to death on the ps4 did they have anything to do with um or in the blind forest or is it just because so. it or is it just because the game is getting kind of compared to that no because i heard i they heard something people, no. tied with it with ori but, pretty much all okay. the games they've made from what i know are yeah. that like 8-bit okay kind of retro, yeah, style. retro style yeah um it seems like they're using the same engine as uh tower fall mm -hmm. it looks like a lot of the the movement is, is very similar to tower falls okay. tower fall ascension if you've even played this i played it on the ps4 but it's, i believe it's on the xbox i'm pretty sure so. um fantastic multiplayer game like almost like a 8-bit smash bros kind yeah. of like With the I, the i love the arrow physics in it oh yeah you're basically yeah. jumping around and trying to, trying shoot, to shoot the other players and you with can do arrows. like air dodges it it becomes like deeper as you get oh, better yeah. at it right you can pick yeah. up different types exploding arrows yeah. there's like jump portals where you, you can jump yeah, yeah you can <laughs> jump on their heads there, you yeah. jump through the bottom and you come love out it. the top oh man frantic multiplayer yeah. fun i really love that game uh so this apparently there's a really interesting story Oh, cool. Tied with this. Yeah. So, which I just assumed it was, uh, there's a name for these platformers. Um, but it's a lot like uh, Super Meat Boy, where, like, literally you're constantly re re yeah. restarting the level, uh -huh. where you die, like, a lot. Like, it's a really tough platformer, mm -hmm. um, which can kind of scare me off a little bit. Uh, but the interesting thing is, like, I keep yeah. hearing that there's a really interesting story tied to this game, which makes yeah. me want to play it even more. And I heard it's, um, yeah, like, frustrating in that sense, but. Um, kind of like a like cuphead and stuff like that like you instantly are back if you die like it's just an instant reload so you're not like having to deal with that loading frustration right? that's key yeah, so like i always remember that with like, like trials hd yeah. remember that how quickly yeah. one button boom you're back right so, so you don't even care you're just like all right go again yeah. go again yeah and before you know it, it's two hours later and you're still on the same, still on the same damn level and you're times. ready to throw your controller across <laughs> the room yeah so yeah celeste i believe it's it's actually on the switch PS4 that's and probably Xbox. the platform I'll pick it up on. Honestly. Yeah, the yeah. problem with that is the D-pad. Now I have oh, one of those yeah. cool eight bit, uh, eight bit Doe controllers yeah. that has a proper D-pad. So I would probably use that or a Pro controller. Mm. Um, although I did, quick side note here, I did mm. see that there are some custom shells now that you can put on your Joy Cons for your Nintendo Switch. And so it. basically, you take it apart, and uh, you can get a left one that has a D-pad. What? So basically, on the inside, it would just compress the button like it like it were yeah. an actual D-pad. And apparently it works pretty well. So it's I have so thought weird of that they don't have a D-pad. Why well, yeah. I, I can't believe they haven't released just a, thing. just yeah. release a single Joy-Con that has a proper D-pad. Sure, I would um, an easy thing to do for Nintendo. I think yeah. that I think that eventually will it happen. It makes sense with how many kind of like 2D platformers are on the Switch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I don't mind using analog for that, but yeah, this one might you might want that. I mean, that I've played for, Shovel Knight even yeah. just using the four buttons. It's yeah. doable, but I would still you know D-pad's sure, the best prefer. way to do it. Yeah. So. Yeah, check out Celeste. Um, yeah. Hopefully by the, by the next podcast, we will have played it. Um, yeah. I reached out to the company, but didn't hear back. I tried to get us codes, oh. but unfortunate. Oh, uh, you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't get them all, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's kind of it for... We've got some really interesting releases coming up soon. We've got... Um, yeah. Uh, Shadow of the Colossus Shadow of the remastered. Colossus. Uh, the Bayonetta 1 and 2 remastered. Yeah, I think that's uh, second week of February. Um, Shadow of the Colossus comes out this February, next week. So I think Tuesday yeah. probably. Um, 
I think Dragon Quest Builders is out on Switch in February. That's coming soon. Yeah, I believe we're game, getting but... a copy or a code for that. So cool. I'll hopefully have a, um, maybe a, hopefully a review up on Goliath, but mm -hmm. we can at least talk about it on the podcast. Yeah. That's one that I'm really looking forward to. I played the demo. I mentioned that last time. Yeah. Um, highly recommend you guys go check out that demo on uh, the Nintendo Switch. Really fun game. So this will be the first time I think we've talked about board games on the podcast. Oh, that's right. But, Sorry. Yeah. So the reason I haven't been playing much video games over the past two weeks is I've been playing a ton of board games. Um, like my friends and I have just really gotten into them again okay. over the past two weeks. And one game specifically, um, Betrayal at House on the Hill. Have you heard of this? No, game? I haven't. Okay. Um, so I'm I'll, like I'll, casually into board right. games. Like I'll, I've got uh, you know Ticket to Ride. Sure. I've got, yeah. Uh, King of Tokyo. Yeah. Um, I think I actually heard about this one on an episode of DLC at yeah. some point during uh, the board DLC. game section. Yeah. Uh, which I am paying more attention to now these days. Now that I'm more into board games. I do yeah. that too because yeah. you know I'm into Once VR too. Them, so I love sure. when uh, you know DLC podcast. Yeah. Check it out. Jeff yeah, a little, little plug there. Yeah. Christian Spicer, yeah. one of our favorite. Yeah, we listen to it every week. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, okay, so Betrayal, uh, so it's like a co-op game, um, I think up to six players, you start out, um, basically exploring this, like, kind of haunted mansion, and, uh, each turn someone goes and you're exploring rooms, essentially, is the first part of the game. The game's set in two different stages. So the first part, you're exploring rooms, you're kind of, uh, picking up items, and more like revealing the house, and it's kind of different each time, so there's an upstairs and there's, like, a basement. And you can only access those at certain points if you reveal a certain tiles. Like a fog of war type thing? Sort like, of, yeah. Okay, interesting. It's with like uh, tiles. So you kind yeah. of pick it up. So and it's as like you, you get yeah, further, you flip the going tiles through doors to reveal. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, now, are you working together? Yes. Okay. At, you know, cool. Yeah. Like at first you're doing that and you're, it's not like really a lot of like teamwork going on at first because you're really just collecting things. Like each character has like stats too that you have to like keep track of. Okay. So you could like find an item that gives you like plus two might or something and um things like that but uh you'll pick up certain cards called like omen cards sometimes and there's like symbols on each room that tells you kind of like what to pick up like which cards okay and so every time after someone gets an omen you have to do a haunt roll um so you basically you know roll dice and if you get um lower than that number okay. then the haunting starts so and something's then, gonna like yeah. show up like so a... this is where it gets really cool because <laughs> i'm uh, in already this yeah great. right like it's amazing i'm gonna bring it into the office actually i think we should play it yeah. um so depending on who like which character uh triggered the haunt event in which room they're in it corresponds to like there's like 50 different scenarios in the in the book uh, okay or whatever and it tells you like what kind of haunting you're gonna have so that person interesting not, not necessarily but usually that person will become the traitor then and then the objective changes where everyone else is working for some objective and then the traitor is working on to like sabotage everyone so it's got like a manual like if yeah. this then yeah. this yeah. like okay so it almost sounds like a little and bit there's D &D two there's, yeah but there's two separate manuals so the one the the kind of survivors or group gets their manual and then the other person has to go out of the room and read their thing. And so then they <sighs> don't cool. know what their objectives are, right? Interesting. Yeah. And then there's like a whole bunch of, like we had one um, happen where one guy turned into like a werewolf and he could turn other people into werewolf and it became this like frantic thing where we had to like um, build a gun, build bullets or like make bullets for wow. it. And like it turned into this like showdown in the basement where we were like, going in the room, passing the gun, like, shooting the werewolf, and it was such a blast. I was the traitor the other night, and I literally didn't get to make a single move because they just, like, won. It, like, it, it was all these things that played together where I couldn't do a thing. So that kind of sucked, but usually that's not the case. The, the thing I love about those games are yeah. each play session is can be so Completely different. Completely different. So the game has, yeah. like, almost endless replay value. Exactly. Like each scenario, you know, you get a different scenario. Yeah. I that, was not expecting awesome. to become, like, you know, this into a game. But, um, yeah, a Betrayal at House on the Hill, highly recommend Do you know, it. was it a newer game? Or? I think it's somewhat new. Like, it's been the last few years anyway it okay. came out. Um might be a 2016 game and the next one we're gonna try is uh pandemic legacy okay i, I yeah. do i own that okay. one. Oh, do you um, the legacy yeah yeah oh yeah pandemic well there's pandemic and then there's pandemic legacy i don't know if you're familiar with the legacy games I'm, i have i have pandemic Le legacy it is okay legacy. okay that's like the one where it just like keeps going you're like you're eventually you're like ripping up cards and like the rules change as you go yeah you're like what is it? it's it's about like a virus yeah and yeah it's a co-op game where you're working yeah. together also yeah. 
yeah, so I'm going to start that one up and see. I've played the regular Pandemic a bunch of times, but I'm really interested. This will be my first Legacy game. So My recommendation for a board game, mm. Formula D or Formula Day, which I also got from Jeff Ganada okay. on I haven't heard on of it. DLC. It's a F1 racing game. Don't let that Ooh, scare you okay, off. That's interesting. You have it's it's hard to explain. Yeah, um, sure. You, it's not a co-op game. It's like I think four to four to eight players. So you each have your race car and you have your little gear shifter. So you have to like approach a corner at a certain speed, or you'll take damage points, and you're going around this. Oh, okay. It, it really it's like a race really slowed down, and it's like yeah, and tactical, and really like tactical. Okay. Um, huh. You can screw over the other players, right. which I always love that aspect of board games. Um, you don't need to have any interest in F1 or racing sure. or cars. Really, really fun game. That we play a lot. Um, Ticket to Ride, which is a classic. I've You're... never actually played Ticket to Ride. I think I've played like the phone version before. Which is but great. I, I played yeah. it a lot. The I couldn't figure. Like I was like just casually getting into it. I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be. It's doing. like anything. I think it I want to try. It. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a few. I want to try the board game round. Yeah. But, Agricola. Uh, have you tried that? What? Agricola. No. Okay, that was one I started playing too. It's kind of like farming game, a little more involved than like Catan. There's so many board, so many board games that I really want to play, yeah. but like I just don't finding a group and yes. like doing that's hard. You know, so, like yeah. it's hard for me. Like I just don't have like I don't yeah. socialize as much as I used to. You know, yeah. I've got wife and two kids, I'm, and you know, yeah. my wife and I. I've got several board games. Um, Mr. Jack is a good one that I sometimes play with mm. my. I think it's Mr. Jack um, that I play with my wife. Like th that's what it's nice to have games like Pandemic where. You know, the two of you can just you can sit just down play and play a game yeah, together. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Uh, board games are awesome. We should, uh, yes. you know, if I... We should talk about them more, yeah. If yeah, I played more, more maybe yeah. we could make it, like, every once in a while, talk yeah, about we'll which board games section. we played. Yeah, so. for sure. Uh, so now moving into our random story of the week. Nick, yeah. you, you told me you might have uh, an interesting one. I might so have I'll let, something. I'll let you start. This yeah, time. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, big headline here. This is from uh, Gizmodo. It says... We don't even live there yet, but humans have already left over 400,000 pounds of trash on the moon. Interesting. Yeah, so it's kind of going over um, just, you know, how much space crap NASA okay. has dumped on the moon from, you know, the various missions to the moon. Yeah. Although there haven't been any in, like, what, 45 years now? Yeah. Um, the alarm so, yeah, we, so we visited the moon 12 times. There's over 400 pounds of garbage up there. 400 uh, tons? 400 pounds. 400,000 pounds. 400, I don't know what pounds. that is in tons, okay. but... Uh, maybe you can look it up in the meantime. I don't think it really matters. No, but um, So, I mean, a lot of this is because of all the equipment, right, that they bring there. And a lot of it is designed to, you know, be left there just to make the journey home easier, yeah. right? So you figure, oh, whatever, it's the moon. Who cares about dumping stuff there? Yeah. But I just think it's funny, right, because <laughs> if we ever, like this article points out, um, you know, it's like each moon landing has left behind 22, a 22,700-pound lunar lander. Plus a bunch of other crap the astronauts brought along, like golf balls, $2 bills, and actual crap in the form of giant bags of human waste. <laughs> They're still waiting there for the moon's first settlers to arrive. So, so yeah. it's already a fixer-upper, like, yeah. before we even got there. The idea of <laughs> yeah. us having to leave our planet, because we've ruined it. It just shows how much, like, going yeah, to... humans, like, just have to create garbage wherever we go, We've got right? a head yeah. start on We've got a head start one. on the moon, on the moon so, moon. so, yeah, <laughs> it's not even clean yet. So, for my uh, random story of the week, Nick, would you spend $500 on a flamethrower? 100%. <laughs> <laughs> now, I guess the next question is, what would you use that flamethrower for? No freaking idea <laughs> so elon <laughs> musk uh his company the the boring company which he created i believe to wait um, is it actually called the boring company yes, that's he amazing created, he, re he created a company called the boring company <laughs> i believe in the past well, year not, not they're too not long coming ago. out with boring initiative and i think their sure. i think their main initiative was to um, de <laughs> develop um a system where they could cheaply dig tunnels Oh. Because they want to be able to have, okay. you know, transportation through an underground network of tunnels. Right. And right now it's, like, super cost prohibitive, and they want to find a cheaper way to do that, uh, which is really interesting. I mean, yeah. Elon Musk is my hero. This guy is a mad genius. Sure. And yeah. He's done a lot for, you know, electric vehicles and... Um, you know, um, solar panels and solar technology yeah, and stuff like that. He's this really guy, pushing technology forward. He's yeah. just a little out yeah. there, which I which I love. You gotta, I think you have to be if you're do you know. I mean, I a assume this. Company. I think yeah. this started as a joke, sure, um, and then it turned into something that they sold uh, like two million dollars worth of pre-orders for uh, a flamethrower, um, a legitimate boring company flamethrower. Uh, apparently. 
they are legal in the in the states. So my first thought was, oh, there's no way this is legal in Canada. Yeah. Now it was recently um, announced that they are legal in Canada. Oh, well. But I would assume that there would be an issue of shipping a flamethrower to yeah, Canada. Well, I don't know how that work. would work. Yeah. But uh, apparently, owning send a flame... the canisters separately. I don't know or whatever. Maybe you know? that's it. Know. Maybe they can't sell it with um, yeah. whatever powers it. Yeah. I don't know if it's propane or what type of gas. Um, but yeah, uh, apparently it's legal if it's under if the flame is under ten feet. Ah, interesting. Okay, so, I see. <laughs> there's been a bunch of video like Elon Musk has been trolling people all over sure. oh. uh, social media. Yeah. So he's like, um, "Do not buy one of these flamethrowers." Like he's like, "I highly recommend you do not buy one of these flamethrowers." And then like twenty minutes later, he's like, "Unless you love having fun or something." Like that. <laughs> like, and I, I think it started out as a joke, and and you can still pre-order them now. Um, and I actually thought about it, but then I was like, I don't know. It'd be cool to have, I guess it'd be yeah. more of a thing you put on your shelf and just be like, I have a freaking flamethrower. Flame thrower. Yeah. But the practicality and like, even like for fun of use, um, Devin at work mentioned that you could clear your snow with it. And I was like, that's oh, not bad. Oh, yeah. not bad. Clear your yeah. walkway with right? a flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> Forget the, <laughs> Forget the shovel. I got this. <laughs> Snowblower? No way. Yeah. Defrost. Oh, do you need to defrost the car? <laughs> My wife would be all over that. Remember yeah, I told right? you a story about how she cleared the snow with a shovel off oh, of the yeah, car? And she'd be out there with a flamethrower. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> and she's just going to burn the vehicle instead. <laughs> I'm just like, bring this thing camping with you. Get your little sure. teepee started for your fire and just hit it with a <laughs> flamethrower. Yeah, get, get rid of that stick. We're not. We're starting the fire. Like, <laughs> or you yeah. go like backpacking and you have like the super lightweight everything. So you're carrying minimal, but you're carrying a flamethrower to start your fire. So I thought, right? so. <laughs> or, you know, to as a deter bears, deter, deter bears. <laughs> set bears on fire. Oh, the more I hear about Roast this, maybe, it, maybe it's not a good idea. No. But yeah, so you can purchase a $500 flamethrower. It'll be interesting to see what happens with these flamethrowers and how much trouble people get into them with them and uh, if there's any backlash I mean, whatever. towards... People can own guns. I mean, what, you know? You're right. It, can, uh, it only, this thing goes less than 10 feet, you know? <laughs> a little less range than them. Funny bullet. enough, like, that was like one of the turrets to me. I'm like, because I saw a video of it and it just kind of like shoots out a little bit. And I'm like, oh man, I would picture really a flamethrower as like anything I want to burn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't want to have like, to stand like right a beside. Vietnam War flamethrower. <laughs> or the what was yeah. the one in Alien? Did she have? A, I think. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, flamethrower. Yeah. yeah, that's what I pictured. That's what but. you need. Yeah. So yeah, like torch light. you can pick up a uh, flamethrower for five hundred bucks through the Boring Company. You know, but stay safe. <laughs> Anyway, guys, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you again for watching and or listening to this edition of the Goliath Gamecast. As always, you can find me online at Nick underscore Steinberg. And you can find me anywhere at C-J-R, S-E-E-J-Y-A-R-E. -E. You can download the Goliath Gamecast on iTunes, Stitcher, the Google Play Store. You can also see the video format of the podcast on the Goliath YouTube page or Goliath Facebook page. Thanks again for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.